it's quite difficult to explain this question to you, so you'll really have to stretch your own minds. I'll do it as well as I can. I know the experience, and I think you know it. Have you ever found yourself, especially after some enjoyable event, or maybe after some very sad event like a death, or after some annual event like even just Labor Day picnic, or a Memorial Day, or or Christmas time, and you've just come back to your room or your apartment after a whole lot of kind of social intercourse and rejoicing with the family, and you've just sat there, and life has all seemed so just blah, you know. And you just sit there, and you think, oh, it's really a drag, why bother? You know. Why even get going? And I suppose some of us would describe it as depression, and maybe it is depression partly. But primarily, it's just a feeling, oh, what are all those people out there flitting and buzzing around for? What's the point? I just don't see any point in getting going. Have you ever had that kind of feeling? And I suspect, you know, that most of us here, from the person who is just an expert on depression, and I know some of you are just experts on depression, (laughs) to those of us who maybe have very little trouble with depression, I think all of us have probably known times When we've been like that, we've just sat down and thought, oh, why bother? Why even bother going on? It seems just so pointless. Now, loved ones, actually, I really do believe that those times are blessed gifts from our Creator to make us realize that we are not able to produce our own dynamic for life. I really do. I think God allows those moments to come to let us realize we don't have what it takes to keep going in this life effortlessly. There's some dynamic that we don't have in our lives. Because you know, as well as you're sitting there, you know what you do in those moments. You know what all we healthy-minded people do. We say, listen, this is stupid. I must get my knitting. Or I must go out and ride my motorbike. Or I have work to do and jobs to do and miles to go before I sleep and promises to keep. And we get going. And you know every mum and dad that has ever looked after any of us poor little souls here, they have all told us that. Look, you can't just sit around, you know. Get up and get going. We all feel like that. And that's what we say to each other. We all feel like that at some time. And in a way, it's good, you know. I'm sure it's... We're not meant to sit there and just uh, deteriorate. But, But I'm wondering, are we not taking our typically human way out when we ignore the whole vacuum that is obviously there. We ignore the whole emptiness that we feel at that moment. I mean, don't you? You feel as if there should be some life that can come up in me at times like this and can at least lead me on. I don't want it to lift me all the way, but there should be surely something at that moment besides emptiness that kind of goes out in a certain direction. I shouldn't have to wind it all up myself. And yet that's what we do, isn't it? We get ourselves back to some old goal. Well, I I have to get to work in the morning because I have to get money, because I have to eat, because I have to keep alive so that I can feel like this again, so that I... (laughs) 
And probably, probably that's the killer of all the things we do to get going. They themselves end up in futility, don't they? I mean, we, we keep going, you know, say, they, well, those of us who are working say, well, we have to get up and work. I mean, they're depending on us. But later on, weeks, months, hence, we come up against a moment again when we wonder, well, well, they're depending on me, but, well, they give the other fellow a gold watch after 25 years and the business carried on. They probably aren't depending on me too much. And then, of course, most of us saw in the old recession that uh, they didn't want to depend on us. They closed up the firm and that was it. And many of us find that these artificial drives that we produce in ourselves, which I agree, I mean, I'm with you. I'm with the most commonsensical, practical, down-to-earth person here in this room, that they're necessary, but these common-sense drives that we produce to get ourselves going in those moments when we feel blah, they in themselves are pretty futile and empty and are pretty pointless and meaningless because there's none of them that actually bear much examination, is there? I mean, you know it, every mum and dad here who gets going for the sake of the kids. Well, you get going for the sake of the kids, and then the kids grow up, and they go off, and they get going themselves, and there you are left together and looking at each other, and, well, you've done something, you've given something to the world, but inside, you still have to keep reminding yourself of that. And similarly, those of us who gain any kind of significance at all, if that's our thing, you know, we want to be somebody, we want people to look at us, that's our drive to keep going in moments of feeling blah, we too find that it's pretty pointless because you get to a certain position and what does it matter? It doesn't matter much when you die. It doesn't matter much what kind of a casket they give you or really it doesn't matter much whether you had thousands at your funeral or whether you had five at your funeral. And so, loved ones, I would suggest to you that maybe those are moments of truth and not moments of untruth. And maybe what you should do at those moments is instead of producing some artificial drive that is in itself pointless, maybe you should see that that's why God has made and made available to us a person and a dynamic like the Holy Spirit. And maybe you should just stop in your tracks and see, yeah, I have nothing inside me. I have nothing here. Boy, I could commit suicide this very moment. And maybe you should start saying, Lord God, have you some life that gets me going? Have you some life that can lift me? Have you some life that I can submit myself to that would take me beyond moments like this? And loved ones, there was a moment when it was pretty blah at the beginning of the universe. Really, it was. I, I, it would, it's worse than you. Look, Genesis 1 and verse 1. And I mean, even you are not quite like this. Now, sometimes as a school teacher, I felt one of the adjectives uh, applied, but still, I I don't think any of us are just as bad as this. It's verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then the moment of blah. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. Pretty chaotic. Pretty much nothingness. And the last half of the verse reads, And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. Now, loved ones, right from the very beginning of creation, this person, because he is a person, which is referred to in the Bible as Holy Spirit, This person has always been moving to bring order and light and life where there is nothingness and where there is vacuum and emptiness. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. Really, that's what he does. And he is given to us 
Because we humans are not self-starters. We are not self-starters. We are not independent in the last analysis. What keeps you on this earth? Why are we not all flying off with the centrifugal force? You know, obviously we're not self-dependent. Obviously we can't keep the thing in space. We don't know why it's flying around here. You who think you're most self-made and most competent, you can't even keep your heart going. You don't, no doctor can explain why your heart keeps pumping. We're anything but self-dependent creatures. And those moments of blah, those moments when you suddenly think, boy, the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world. When you feel that and think that, that's a moment when your maker is trying to get through to you. Look, you can't. You don't have it. You don't have what it takes to keep going on your own. I have a life and a dynamic that will ensure that you are never depressed, that you never have those moments of blah. And loved ones, that's what the Holy Spirit is. And really, you know, I think a lot of you sitting here have kind of missed this at times because... I think a lot of us maybe are Christians here. You know, I think a lot of you are Christians. And yet you probably have very little awareness of the Holy Spirit in your life at all. And I think it's because you in your turn, like the Mohammedans and the Buddhists and the Baha'i and the Mormons, have taken part in what is purely a mental exercise. Because, of course, the whole purpose of Jesus coming was to give us the Holy Spirit. That's it, you see. The whole purpose of Jesus coming was to fill us with this Holy Spirit. Now, that applies again, again and again, you know. John 1 and 33, if you like to look at just one of the verses. John 1 and 33, and some of you know it. Uh, John the Baptist was talking, you remember, about Jesus... And he says in John 1 and 33, it's page 922, 922. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now the whole purpose of Jesus' life and death was to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. But I think many of us here have entered into a kind of Christianity that is almost independent of that real dynamic inside you. I think there are many of us that still have moments of blah, and we're still Christians. And we have moments of depression, and we're Christians. And we have moments when we feel there's nothing inside me to lift me, and we call ourselves Christians. And I think it's because we have entered into a kind of believism about Christianity. All of us here have listened to the plain gospel of John 3 and 16. And I'm afraid we've misinterpreted it. Because we've heard it, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. And many of us here have been taught If I believe on Jesus, I'll have eternal life. I may not sense that anything has happened inside me. I may not feel any different, but I have eternal life if I believe on Jesus. But we have interpreted belief on Jesus as a purely intellectual experience. And we have said to ourselves, well, I I believe on John F. Kennedy. I believe... He existed. I believe in Ford. I believe he exists. Believing on Jesus must be believing that he's the Son of God. Well, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And so many of us have taken it at that level and have said, I'm a Christian. I have eternal life. 
I don't feel any different. I still have trouble with my inner life, but I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, loved ones, there is a terrifying verse, you know, in James, and it would be good just to look at it. And uh, it refers, too, to some people who believe. I'm happily pointing you to it and don't know where it is. Can anyone give me it, loved ones? 2.19, loved ones. James 2 and 19. It's page 1055. 1055. James 2 and 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Now, belief itself is not what enables you to contact this Holy Spirit of life that God has made available. And I think many of us are caught in that. See, I think many of you would go even further. You'd say, oh, now we know that. Uh, We believe that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Now, that's what makes you a Christian, isn't it? But, loved ones, do you see that it's still intellectual belief? It's still, I believe that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. You might go even further and say, oh, I know what you're getting at. You're getting at that it has to be personal. Okay, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. But loved ones, I think many of you here this morning do believe that. I think you believe that Jesus died for your sins. And you've determined now that you're going to live for him. And really what you're involved in is still a mental kind of conversion. Because you have never dealt at any time with the Holy Spirit. And you remember every verse in Scripture points to that. That the whole purpose of God sending Jesus was so that we would have the Holy Spirit. Remember Galatians 4 and 6 runs, and God sent the Spirit of his Son into us. Jesus himself in that passage in New Testament says, it's to your advantage that I go away because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. But when he comes to you, he will lead you into all truth. Repeatedly in the Bible, Jesus and the Father points to the fact that the whole purpose of Jesus' death and life is that we would receive the Holy Spirit, that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we'd be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But loved ones, I submit to you that many of us here this morning are still involved in a purely mental experience which we call Christianity. But we have no intimate sense of Jesus as a person in our lives. And above all, we have no sense in our lives that we're following and submitting to the Holy Spirit moment by moment. In other words, really, this is the situation we're in. I don't know if all of you, most of you have seen this kind of a diagram and probably know it by heart. But you know that uh, if you look at the biblical outline of the personality and you think of that passage, you remember that verse in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, may the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly and keep your spirit and soul and body blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. God obviously shows us that we exist on three levels in our personalities. Not that there's a spirit that you can take out and a soul that you can take out, but that there are three levels that you exist on at different times. And the body consists of, in a sense, those three. And the soul, if you follow it through in the Bible, is the word suke, which becomes psyche, which becomes psychology in our own English language. And that's the psychological part of us and includes the mind and the will and the emotions. And the spirit part, if you follow through all the references to spirit in the Bible, indicate to you that the spirit has the ability to commune with God, to know what God wants you to do, and to judge your actions of your will in the light of that. Now, loved ones, I'm afraid what many of us have experienced is a purely psychological experience of Christianity. With our minds, we believe that Jesus died for our sins. With our wills, we exercise ourselves to try to live like Jesus. 
and with our emotions from time to time, especially if we're witnessing, we feel some kind of uplift. But the whole thing takes place there. And of course, the new birth takes place there. And the baptism with the Spirit takes place there. And any relationship with God occurs in our spirits. But many of us have run a purely mental experience of Christianity. You could call it a mental experience of Jesus, but Jesus is a person. And you can hardly even say that it's an experience of Jesus. You can say it's a mental experience of Christianity as a philosophy, a mental experience of Jesus as an idea or a bundle of principles, but not as a real person. Because we've seen the thing primarily as something that we do ourselves, we believe with our minds, we obey with our wills the things that we think a Christian should do, and from time to time when we're together like this, maybe we have some experience of uplift in our emotions, but all we're involved in is a mental experience of Christianity. And the proof of it is that we experience at times what the Mohammedans, the Buddhists, The Baha'i, the Confucianists, what they all experience, we experience the feeling that we're carrying a heavy weight. Many of us have entered into that kind of experience, and we have from time to time the experience, boy, religion is a heavy load, and I'm carrying it. And we have great trouble in the will area. At times there are things that we don't want to do, and we make ourselves do them. At times, there are times when we don't want to go out witnessing, but we make ourselves go out witnessing. And loved ones, the reason is because we have not dealt with this dear person, the Holy Spirit. Because, of course, God's will is this, that we would receive the Holy Spirit in through our spirits by communion with God. He would tell us what we ought to do through the intuition. Our conscience would judge us on that, that we're passing that on to our wills. Our will would exercise control over our minds and our thought life. Our thought life would pass it through our emotions and into our body and out to the world. And that is the Father's will. But many of us, loved ones, have stopped it at that point. Now, what is the answer? Well, the answer is to deal with this dear Holy Spirit. The whole purpose of Jesus dying for us was so that we'd receive the Holy Spirit into us. And loved ones, the the verse is clear, and you've heard it often at, at all kinds of meetings. It's Revelation 3 and 20. And this is the heart of coming alive in God and the heart, honestly, of deliverance from that feeling of blah, that feeling that we have no dynamic in our lives, that feeling of deadness. It's Revelation 3 and 20. It's page 1074. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. And that, loved ones, that is the statement of the Spirit. Because if you look back to verse 13... The chapter reads, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then the Holy Spirit speaks. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door here and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. And I will sup with him and he with me. Now, loved ones, what's the secret? Well, the secret is that instead of making up your own salvation plan here, I'm going to believe that Jesus died for my sins, and I'm going to exercise my will to do what I think a Christian should do, you'll begin to see, Lord Jesus, this Holy Spirit that you have sent to us. I can see that you treat him as a person. I can see that you treat him as an equal. And I can see, Lord Jesus, that you have said that that's why you died, so that I could receive this Holy Spirit. Well then, Holy Spirit, will you tell me what I can do to receive you? And the Holy Spirit will begin to explain to you the things in your own life that you need to do 
for him to come into you. Because that's important, loved ones. The Holy Spirit is a gift. But he is a gift given to certain people. And those people are mentioned in Acts 5 and 32. God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey. So, loved ones, the reason you do not have the Holy Spirit in your life is because you've never, ever, ever asked him what you, he wanted you to do. You haven't. You've maybe asked me, or you've asked somebody else, or you've looked it up in the Bible, or you've watched other Christians, and you've said, oh, a Christian prays, he reads the Bible every day, he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, and he tries not to lose his temper, and he tries not to get angry, and you've tried to do all these things, but have you ever, ever, ever turned to the Holy Spirit in faith and said, Holy Spirit, I even feel corny doing this because I don't know that you're there, but I believe Jesus, and I believe that he really lived. I believe that this, these are historical documents here, and I believe that what he said is true, and I believe that according to the evidence, he's the son of the maker of the world, and he said that you're real. So, Holy Spirit, I ask you, what is there in my life that I need to change for you to come in and begin to be a by dynamic person and power inside me? And loved ones, that's the first step. Honestly, it is. And if I could encourage your hearts, you know, the Holy Spirit is a dear, gentle person. Really, really. And I'm sure some of you, you know, have thought, oh, that old evangelical Christianity is like a bulldozer. Have you ever? I've felt at times like that. It's a bulldozer. They thump you with John 3 and 16, and you have to believe it, and you have to get up there, and you have to do what they tell you to do. Loved ones, that's not the dear Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a dear, gentle person like Jesus. And he will deal with you as a gentleman. His attitude is always, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He is always knocking. He will never blast that door down. And that's why you'll never have an experience of the Holy Spirit unless you want him. Unless you want him. Really, really, loved ones. He'll always treat you as the host in the house. He'll always say, I stand at the door and knock. I'm the guest. You're the host. And that's the way it'll always be until you allow it to be otherwise. And I won't come in unless you ask me in. And loved ones, that's why, you know, I think some of you get a bit discouraged because you kind of have the attitude, oh, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. Well, old Pascal, you remember this French scientist, he said, God is a hidden God, and he will not reveal himself except to those who seek him with all their heart. And you know, it's reasonable. After all, you and I go to a lot of trouble to get into a lot of other things. And we're prepared to ask very often for some of the other things we have in our lives. And God expects us to be similarly anxious and enthusiastic before he will send the spirit of his son into us. And loved ones, that's the first step. Honestly, it is. It's very simple. You could do it at home, you know, today. You could go, do it going in the car on the way home for lunch. You could do it on your knees tonight at your bedside. Don't complicate the thing. Just close your eyes and say, Holy Spirit, I do believe you're there. I have no experience of you. I've had an experience of some kind of mental Christianity here. But I don't have any real sense of a dynamic within my own life. And I have those moments when I just could commit suicide. It seems so hopeless. Holy Spirit, will you speak to me? Will you give me some impression of what I need to change in my life uh, so that you can begin to come in and take over? Now, loved ones, then... Do what immediately comes to your mind. Believe the Holy Spirit, you know. Don't get a thought and then think, oh, I wonder, is it the Holy Spirit? You've asked him, take him at his word. As long as it's not, stand on your head and say the Lord's Prayer backwards. As long as it's not something dumb, you know. As long as it's not something that obviously you know from Scripture is not right. Then do it. If the Holy Spirit says to you, you're harsh with your wife. You are thoughtless with your roommate. You've just got hard, hard, hard as nails. You just care only about yourself. 
Whatever he says, respond. If it's some t- something down to earth, don't drink. Then don't drink. Don't smoke. Don't smoke. Then don't smoke. Stop swearing. Then stop swearing. Stop swearing. Do immediately what he tells you. Now, loved ones, don't say to me, is it okay if I try? There's, in, in London, you know, there, we're, Britishers were dumb. Uh, we, you know, in America we say, no smoking, that's it. No smoking. You're not meant to smoke in that area. In London, in some restaurants, they have, try not to smoke. <laughs> so, you can imagine, you know, some fella really belching the old cigar smoke out all over, and the manager coming to him and saying, could you stop smoking? And he says, I'm trying. <laughs> And loved ones, I know, I know, because I've smoked and I've drunk and I think we're all, we've all done these things. But you know that if you're really determined, you stop. You know that. You remember the fellow who was on with Perry Mason? You remember the defense lawyer who always lost the case? Or the prosecuting lawyer who always lost? And you remember the dear fellow? And I mean, he just smoked himself to death. But you remember, there came that time when he saw death staring at him. In the face. He stopped the smoking, and you remember he came on one of those commercials. In other words, when you're faced with it, finally, if the thing is desperate enough, you'll stop. The Father knows that. God knows us, loved ones. God knows if we're desperate enough, we'll stop. God knows if we're desperate enough to have the Holy Spirit in our lives, we'll stop. And loved ones, that's it, honestly. It's no use, you know, saying try. Sure, you'll try. If you're running this old mental thing, you know, I'm trying to be a Christian and I believe the right things and I'm trying to be like a Christian on the outside. There, the old will be trying continually. But when the will ceases to be influenced by the things that are coming in here, you know, this Christian saying, well, if you want to be a Christian, you should go to church twice on Sundays. Well, if you want to be a Christian, you should read your Bible every day. Well, if you want to be a Christian, you should sing three hymns uh, for lunch. Well, if you want to be a Christian... (laughs) All those things, loved ones, when they're coming in that way, it's no use. It's just works of law. But if ever you let that dear will link up with that conscience, moved by the Holy Spirit, if you ever begin to respond to your conscience, the Holy Spirit begins to get a grip in your life and begins to make things real to you. That's why the first step is looking to the Holy Spirit because he influences your conscience and saying, Holy Spirit, What do you want me to stop in my life so that you can come in and begin to be real inside me? And loved ones, that's the first step. And everything, dear ones, everything in Christianity is the Holy Spirit. Now, don't you come at me and say, oh, you've got it wrong, brother, it's Jesus. No, loved ones, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will bear witness to me. And I want you to look to the Holy Spirit now. I don't want you to keep looking to me. If you look to the Holy Spirit, he will direct your eyes to me. And that's the way it runs. But he is your Lord here on earth as I was the Lord to the disciples here on earth. I at this time, I'm at the right hand of the Father. I'm looking down upon you. I'm ruling over the whole universe at this moment. But my Spirit, my Holy Spirit, the counselor that I have sent to you, he's there with you in your room. He's there with you in the car. He's there with you in your study. He's there to counsel with you. And he will decide where you are in regard to me. And he will make me real to you. Now, loved ones, the Holy Spirit is the dear person. And I ask you, you know, to begin to think in those terms, would you? Begin to think in those terms and make your first step Dealing with the Holy Spirit. Don't get all caught up in an excessive, extreme Pentecostalism. Just see that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. We'll talk next Sunday about the kind of relationship the early church had with the Holy Spirit, and you'll see that they always thought of him as the Spirit of Jesus. It was Jesus' friend sent to them. But he is the one who will lead. He will produce a supernatural conversion, supernatural regeneration. He will lead you on to being filled with himself and being anointed with himself. But the first step 
is to take him seriously. So I would ask you, you know, would you, would you begin to do that? Because some of you are, you know, some of us here are pretty hard, aren't we? You know, we, we have hard personalities. We have brash personalities. And some of us are the other way. We're like uh, squashy, rotten tomatoes. We're so soft, you know. And we're sentimental and all right. And it's quite nice, but it has its disadvantages. And some of us are very hard and some of us are very soft. And if you go through a mental Christianity, what do you end up with? You end up with hard Christians and soft Christians. But if you go through a supernatural encounter with the Holy Spirit, you're changed. You're changed by the Holy Spirit. And you become like Jesus. Now, loved ones, that's it. And I don't know how you feel. You know, I suppose if you've read, I'm okay, you're okay, then maybe you're pretty satisfied with your personality. But I think a lot of us here could, wouldn't, uh, could stand a change, you know. And we kind of feel, yeah, there are some things that need to be changed in me. Loved ones, you'll never do it. You'll, you'll produce your own version of goodness if you go through that mental conversion stuff. But if you begin to deal with the Holy Spirit and honor him, he would produce that dynamic so that, loved ones, I really want to guarantee this, so that you'll become so sensitive to the Holy Spirit that you'll never have those blah moments after Memorial Day, after Christmas Day, after a death, after some climactic moment that has, for the moment, raised you above yourself. The Holy Spirit within you, you'll immediately sense his activity within you, and you'll sense him lifting you up. And he won't use you as an automaton, no. He'll just give you the lead, and he'll ask for your cooperation. But I'll tell you, it's something to feel that there's something inside to cooperate with. It just changes your life. When in those moments that are so blah, you sense there's a dynamic inside you that you can cooperate with, and that is life. I really pray, you know, that different ones of you even would forget a lot of the stuff that you believe, you know, and would just deal with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I pray for my brothers and sisters here that you will... Show yourself real to them. Dear Holy Spirit, I know you will. I know you will. I know you're alive. And I know you myself. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll influence them. Even when they get up after the benediction and go home, that you'll influence them to turn round to you and look at you and believe in you and speak to you and expect you to give them some sense in their own lives through their thought life or through words or through lighting up words in a book or even words in the Bible that they'll sense what you want them to do so that you can take a greater hold in their life. Holy Spirit, I pray for my dear friends and we would pray for each other here this morning. Pray for anyone who is even just turned off by this whole deal. And pray, Holy Spirit, that you will show them that you are better than every one of us. You are more winsome and more universal than any man or woman. And you will be to them what they need. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for sending us the Holy Spirit. Thank you for sending us a deliverer, not a deliverer in our sins, but a deliverer from our sins. Thank you. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and throughout this coming week. Amen.